Hey everyone, welcome to Energy, Empathy, and Diversity, How Energy Can Lead to Making Authentic Connections. My name is Michael Unger, uh, here hosting uh, another fantastic workshop uh, with the uh, Youth Innovation uh, Showcase. Welcome back, uh, everyone. If you've uh, been to some of the, one of these webinars before, um, we're going to have a chance to interact with uh, our special guest today that's going to be talking about those three things I just mentioned, energy, empathy and diversity and i can guarantee you uh that uh the energy is going to come so i hope you got your seatbelts uh strapped on because this <laughs> is going to be a fun one because i already uh talked to uh marco pasqua uh during our podcast on let's innovate are you listening to let's innovate have you uh liked and subscribed our podcast uh that episode uh was as the kids say fire i don't even know if i'm using that <laughs> co correctly uh, <laughs> uh fire lit you know all the above right <laughs> uh that's right and that voice uh that you just heard is marco pasqua uh who's an award-winning entrepreneur accessibility consultant inspirational speaker with cerebral palsy he went into a pursuit of a career in technology and after graduating from the the Art Institute of Vancouver. He spent five years in the video game industry. We're going to hear some of these stories in just a minute. Uh, during the recession of 2010, he lost his job, which turned out to be the biggest blessing in disguise. Marco decided it was time uh, to use his voice to make a positive impact on the world. So he built his own brand as a professional speaker and entrepreneur. Throughout his life, he has been involved with a number of organizations as a spokesperson, helping to spread advocacy for persons with disabilities across Canada. As an accessibility and inclusion consultant, he has worked with some of the BC's biggest change-driven business leaders who are champions for more accessible, inclusive workplaces. He believes that making authentic, meaningful connections with people in our lives is the key to unlocking our full potential. So let's make a authentic and meaningful connection uh, with Marco right now. Hey, Marco. Hey, hey, how's it going? Oh, it's going great. It's uh, here in Vancouver. It's actually the sun is out. Uh, you know, right. you can kind of see it hitting the side of my head uh, here. I don't have my <laughs> ring light on. Decided to go with the natural light. Uh, Very so cool. you've got the uh, Back to the Future uh, set up in the background there, looking mm -hmm. uh, like uh, we're going to go back in time. Uh, we are actually going to go back in time because we're going to be talking a little <laughs> bit about my history, which is really, really cool. So let me just screen share here. Okay, great. So I'm uh, hoping you can see what's on the screen there. Now, before I get started, uh, Michael, I wanted to ask a, a question of the, yeah. of the audience. Who, uh, who here who's, been, who's watching today knew what they wanted to do when they grew up or, or kind of know what their dream job is or dream industry? Now, when you, when you ask that question, like what age are you kind of like talking about? Like, like I'm right talking now? to everyone in the audience, every yeah. single person. I want to know if you've known kind of where you wanted to get started in life, what you wanted to do, that sort of thing. Don't be shy. You know, you can say either yes or no, or you can actually give specific examples. And I want to throw to my man, uh, Michael here to, to kind of let me know what people are saying in the chat. Yeah, absolutely. Well, um, you know, one of the things when I was young was that I had a lot, uh, I didn't have a specific, um, you know, job. Um, I just kind of like knew what I liked, <laughs> if, if that makes any sense. Totally. That makes you know, perfect sense. It didn't, it, there wasn't really like a job. I just knew that I liked thinking about uh, weird and interesting, surreal type things, almost kind of like a storyteller, but I wasn't right. exactly sure that I wanted to be a storyteller. I just knew that that was kind of what I liked, uh, if that makes any sense at all. It makes perfect sense. In fact, this is uh, what you're, you know, you're now doing in your life and in your career. And for me, I have to say, like, I always had a fascination with technology. And so that's why I wanted to pursue technology. And in fact, you know, it's interesting, as you said in my bio, um, you know, I did pursue a career in the game industry, but what's cool is actually what I learned about myself along the way and the process along the way in terms of the kind of person that I wanted to become. And I learned that the more that I innovate in my life and the more that I innovate in the way in which I meet people and the types of people that I'm meeting, the more that I discover about myself. So why don't we just go ahead and I'll, I'll dive right into uh, to the actual 
uh, content itself. Before we before you head off, I can just uh, share sure. some of the responses. Uh, oh sure, yeah. Uh, let's, that, let's that be- do that that we got through. So uh, a lot of people are saying that they uh, had no idea. Um, Mm -hmm. So Nico says involved uh, himself in ideas and projects and uh, um, brought entertainment and, uh, and feeling of reward. So kind of like, you know, kind of like me, I kind of like uh, snaked around, did a whole bunch of different things. Um, Let's see. Uh, Isabel says not really changed for sure throughout the years. Uh, Jamie says told my kindergarten teacher I wanted to be an author, but it changed a whole <laughs> bunch. And now I'm in a job I hadn't even considered, but that works really well for me. I feel that there's a lot of co- commonality that we're all yeah. seeing here is that we had no idea what we wanted to be. And, and most people do in the beginning of their career. But you know, what's interesting is that sometimes you feel you know what your dream job is going to be and then that changes over time and uh, that's one of the takeaways i really want people to focus on throughout my presentation today so um i learned that when you are approaching your career it actually comes down to three main things first you have to change attitudes of yourself and other people in terms of how they look at you and how they look at um, the things that you want to uh, pursue then you shift policies around anything that you feel needs to be changed. And then that's finally in the end when you can transform the leadership and culture of an organization. So let's get into the content. So I'm gonna talk a little bit about breaking down stigmas, not just the uh, assumptions that we place on others, but also stigmas that we have on ourselves. Breaking down attitudinal barriers. I'm gonna be vulnerable with you guys. I'm gonna share with you some of my own personal experiences of what I've gone through and the importance of innovation. Shifting policies, as I said, um, how shifting one policy can make the biggest impact and difference. Defining what I like to call as the cube principle, and we're gonna go a little bit more into that detail uh, in a second. Uh, Building cohesiveness and the importance of making authentic connections. You're gonna see that this is a repeated theme throughout the presentation on the authenticity of making connections with people. What you can do to support inclusion, uh, both as team members and team leaders. And then finally, we have a more formal sort of portion for questions and answers. So with that, let's dive right in. Okay, so changing attitudes. Now, attitudinal barriers are among the first that you'll experience in school or in work. And I think that they actually get in the way sometimes of creating innovation. Now, when I say attitudes, I sometimes mean biases. Now, we place biases on ourselves and other people um, that we work with. And those are unconscious, you know, those are not necessarily things that we're consciously doing or consciously trying to place other people in. Now let's understand some of these biases. Now we do this when we favor people that are similar to us. So oftentimes uh, we will go into groups or into uh, communities of people who kind of remind us of ourselves. And, you know, we often are attracted to more of those kinds of people, people that are similar to us. We choose what is safer and not what is uncomfortable, meaning, you know, we stay inside the box, so to speak. You know, we we don't necessarily want to bridge the gap or kind of go outside of what that looks like, Uh, which is interesting because sometimes people, you know, they get comfortable in life. They get comfortable with what they're doing. And sometimes that's not necessarily a good thing. We make decisions based on our past experiences. So sometimes this can come down to uh, because you've experienced it before, you think that's the only way in which to do something, but that isn't necessarily the case. Sometimes experiencing something new, which is very similar to safety bias can be the best thing for you. We make connections and I to ideas that are closer to us. And I mean this both physically and time-wise. So have you ever been in a meeting where you're the one that's physically there in person and you're around a couple of other people and maybe there's somebody that's connecting over a computer or over the internet or on the phone and you don't necessarily go to that person first for ideas. You almost forget that that person is there. Um, That's what I mean when I say time-wise or physically. And sometimes it's important to remember that there are people that aren't physically in the room with us that may have ideas to share, which are really, really important. We feel the need for speed. Uh, This is about expedience. So oftentimes we'll prioritize something that is due sooner in our lives when something that is due a little bit later in our lives actually might be more important. But because timelines have dictated for many of us exactly what we should act on, we often act on the thing that comes first, but that other thing, like I said, might be more important in the long run. 
We look for solutions from teammates that reflect our worldview. This is an interesting one in today's society when it comes to social media, because oftentimes the things that we see are often fed to us that are more of the same things that we're used to uh, liking or viewing or things of that nature. So um, obviously if you follow certain people on social media, you're only getting those people's social media content. And, you know, sometimes that can be kind of confining. It can confine you to one set of belief systems, right? And I think it's really important to step outside of that belief system sometimes and kind of question all sides so that you can learn and grow as a person. I know that it's been massively beneficial for myself. And lastly, we make assumptions about a person based on their abilities or their appearance. Now, this is something that I'm extremely familiar with because as you heard in the intro, I'm a person with a disability and I've used a wheelchair my entire life. And when it comes to my work life, it's been an interesting thing for me. It's been an interesting journey about learning about challenge and innovation. And in fact, the very first time I had to kind of be faced with these types of challenges was in my very first job through a co-op in high school. It was actually at a computer store. So speaking about technology, this is where I had my first real dive in. In fact, I did really well at this first co-op. So well, in fact, that after my co-op period was over, I asked the manager if he felt that I could start the job in a full-time capacity. I'll never forget um, the kind of look on his face. He looked a little concerned and he said, well, Marco, can I take you out for lunch first? So being a guy never uh, afraid to say no to a free lunch, I decided, you know what, I uh, sure, absolutely. And he took me out to lunch and he explained that as much as he wanted me to join his team in a full-time capacity, well, he'd been modifying my tasks as a co-op student. I didn't really understand what that meant. So I asked him to explain further. He said, well, if you were a full-time employee, I would expect you to do things that I never expected of you as a co-op student. You might have to restock shelves or lift heavy boxes. And boy, oh boy, I could not live with myself if you were to lift one of those boxes and you were to drop that on you and hurt yourself. Now think about that for a second, everyone. I could have been super offended by what he had to say there. I could have been like, excuse me, you were modifying tasks. I could have been super offended that he was making assumptions about what my capabilities were in that moment. But I've always been an optimist and I've always found opportunities in the most challenging of situations, even then. And so instead of getting offended and uh, wheeling off and getting out of there, I said to him, how about I make you a compromise? He said, sure. I said, well, how about this? How about you give me an additional two weeks of say probationary period for me to prove myself. And within that time, if I'm able to prove that I'm able to do exactly what you expect of me, like all the other employees, then, uh, then that's great. I keep the job. But if I'm not able to do it, then no harm, no foul. You can ask me to go and I'll be on my way. Well, he liked this compromise. And so the very next day, I started my job in a full-time capacity. But you know that this story has uh, twists and turns and the universe works in mysterious ways. And as luck would have it, the universe would be presenting itself with its first challenge for me the very next day. You see, a customer came in asking for a video card and video cards happen to be on the very top shelf. Okay, something that I was definitely not gonna be able to reach from my wheelchair. But I sized up the guy and I, you know, he was about six foot something. And I knew that he was definitely going to be able to reach that card. So I bothered to actually start to get to know him. I said, well, what kind of card are you looking for? What kind of computer do you have? That kind of thing. And as we started to move closer to the video card rack, I knew it was my big moment. So I was chatting with him, this and that. And I kind of looked at the, um, looked at the uh, rack, the, the shelf, and I looked at him and I looked at the shelf. And I looked at him and I gestured as though I was going to reach up and grab the card, knowing full well that I wasn't able to reach the card myself. But because I had bothered to make the connection and because he was kind of reading my body language before I could say anything, he goes, yeah, that was the card we were talking about. And he reaches over me, grabs the card, hands it to me. And now I was able to make the sale and, and everything, which was really crazy. But the, the moral of the story here is not that I necessarily used his height to my advantage, although that's part of it. That was part of the innovation component of it. It was actually that my manager the entire time had been watching this entire interaction and his jaw completely hit the floor. More importantly, his expectations of me were completely shattered in what I was capable of. And it was in that moment that he realized that maybe 
just maybe there was an opportunity to continue to work with me. And that regardless of the challenges that I was going to be faced with, I was going to use innovation to my advantage in order to proceed and, and to kind of go forward in my life. And I ended up actually working at the computer store for several more years. So it was a really powerful experience for me. Now, Michael, I'm curious. Yeah. In your first job, did you ever go through experiences where uh, you've had people judge you maybe because it was your first job, your age, that kind of thing? Absolutely, Marco. You know, I was uh, just for, uh, was about to um, chime in and, and ask, but, you know, um, well, I'll, I'll tell my story in a minute, but I was so uh, struck by how 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 much confidence you had to tell the manager, you know, to kind of like give him that ultimatum. Because when I reflect on what I was like as, as a kid, like I was a very shy, you know, kind of like I do what I'm told kind of thing. And if somebody told me like, hey, you're not cut out for this, I would be like, yes, sir. And I would like walk away. <laughs> um, my first job, I worked for my dad's store, which was a game store. And mm -hmm. I would work at the Christmas at Christmas time because it was like really busy. Um, and I was, it was in the middle of a Christmas rush and, um, the manager of the store told me, Michael, like we're, it's really busy. Here's a, a pouch of cash. Like it's really important. <laughs> Go to the bank and get some change. This is really important. We are out of change. And this is like, this is my first big task. I was like, okay, <laughs> all right. And I like, I, I clutched onto this pouch, you know, and ran to the bank that was uh, in the mall. This was Metro town mall, I believe at the time. And I ran to the bank. I stood in line. I got to the front of the line and I said, I would like to cash this, um, you know, we need some change for the store. And the teller looked at me and she was like, and like, how old are you? And I was like, I, I'm, I'm 14. And she's like, you work for the store? Like, yes, I would like to get some change. She's like, I don't think so. I think you're gonna have to like bring your manager here. And I'm like, <laughs> okay. So I slunk back, uh, back to the store, which was very busy. And the manager looked yeah. at me, he's like, where's the change? And I'm like, the bank tellers didn't believe that I, uh, that I worked at the store and would like you to come there kind of thing. Um, <laughs> You know, and it, and so what I'm saying is, you know, I didn't really have the self-esteem to kind of like stand up for myself in that in that moment. You know, wh what other experiences like helped you like um, give you the self-esteem to stand up for yourself? Well, you know, I'll tell you, being born with a disability, it kind of teaches you to uh, to make uh, uh, lemonade out of lemons. And so my entire life, I've kind of had different surgeries. I've spent a lot of time in hospitals and I've learned to advocate for myself over time because not only did I have the standard woes of being in high school and kind of having to prove myself and, and getting my first job opportunity, but in addition to that, I actually, you know, I'm a person with a disability. So people I kind of knew were gonna place their judgments on me. But the point, point of this story is I want everyone to imagine a time in their life where th somebody told them that they couldn't do something or that something was out of reach. And you mm. realize that the person who told you that is not the barrier. It's actually your belief in yourself. As corny as that may sound to some people, it truly is the case. Because if you can't get past the gate or the disbelief of yourself first, you're never gonna be able to convince another person that you have what it takes to push past. And uh, as you, you'll continue to hear throughout the presentation today, you know that's a reoccurring theme for my life, but it doesn't have to be just because this is what I experienced. Each and every one of you have the ability to be innovative in ways that you didn't think you could as I said in the intro here. Now, and speaking to that, with my disability, it was a very visible disability, but what about disabilities that you can't see? What about anxiety and depression, ADHD, autism, learning disabilities? You know, many people that you work with or go to school with, they actually might have one of these conditions either diagnosed or otherwise not diagnosed. And for one reason or another, they decided to not disclose this information because of the stigma that follows that. So I want everyone to check their judgments the next time that they're in a group setting and they see someone acting a little bit antsy or a little bit different than they are. Maybe they're constantly looking at their watch. Maybe they're doing something different. And maybe you think there's something weird about this person's energy here. You know, you don't know what they're going through. You don't know if they have an invisible disability. And regardless of which, it doesn't matter if they do. It's those unique qualities that kind of help to bring out the best in them as a person. And that's the most important part. Now with my love for computers that I discovered at this computer store, 
I was completely set on the idea that a career in technology was now my dream job. That's definitely what I wanted to do. And I was lucky because in that co-op program, you get two co-op opportunities, uh, one in the first part of the school year and one in the last part of the school year. And wouldn't you know it, guys, I did land an amazing second co-op. And that was actually at a game company. Okay, now this is gonna look a little interesting. As you can see there, the statement is, it's your first day, time to sort some screws. So let me tell you exactly how this story broke down for me because I was totally misunderstanding what I was in for. I remember getting to that game studio and being so excited because I was told I was gonna be working with the quality assurance team and testing video games. So picture this, you're imagining me being able to have a whole eight hour work day for about a month or two worth of time to gain experience. And I'm sitting there thinking I'm going to be able to eat chips, drink pop, you know, play some video games. Boy, was I wrong in terms of my misunderstanding of the industry at that time. And I remember getting there and they said, absolutely, the manager is waiting for you. And so I kind of slapped my hands together, rubbed them together and said, all right, Mr. Manager, what's the first task? What game am I going to be able to play uh, to get my workday started? And he sort of paused and said to me, actually, I have something a little different in mind for you. Follow me. And he walks me down what seems to be almost like a hallway in a horror movie. So if you imagine like flickering lights, we were going towards like a server room. It was dark, it was dingy, it was dusty. We went downstairs, we were in a basement, very weird. And there's this really heavy door that he goes to lift open. So he opens the door and we walk through the room and in front of me in this very dimly lit room is a table. And on the table is a pile of screws. And this is not just a regular pile of screws. This pile of screws was disgusting. It was covered in dirt, dust, hair, chocolate. I mean, anything you can imagine, this pile of screws was covered in it. And he looked at me with a very serious look on his face. And he said to me very plainly, I want you to sort these screws. I said, you want me to what? He said, I want you to sort these screws. And actually you better get started now because the workday has already kicked off. And well, we don't have much time left. And with very little instruction, he just gets up, walks out of the room, closes the door, and that's it. It's just me and a pile of screws in a dimly lit room. <laughs> now, in that moment, I could have thought to myself, well, this is a mundane task. What the heck does this have to do with anything that I have to do in the game industry? I could have easily given up and said, like, no, he's probably just joshing me. He's just kidding around and found him and kind of gave up and whatever and then said, no, 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 let's move on. But Instead, again, I decided to use my innovative senses. I looked over and there was actually one of those red solo cups. Uh, actually, there was a, an entire set of them kind of just piled off to the side. They were, they were clean and things like this. And I thought to myself, hey, wait a minute, I have an idea. And I started to sort the screws exactly as he asked, cleaning them off one by one, sorting them by size, by thread count, everything you can imagine. I was just sorting them out and doing it as efficiently and as quickly as I possibly could. And a couple hours later, that manager comes back to check on me. And he was completely astonished that by the time he checked on me much sooner, it was probably about two hours later, I'd completely done and sorted all of the screws. Now, thinking this was some sort of initiation tactic for the new guy, I said, okay, okay. So how long did it take the last guy to do this? You know, is this something that you do for everyone? And he uh, kind of paused pragmatically and he said, well, actually, Marco, you're the first person to ever do this. I said, what do you mean I'm the first person to ever do this? He says, well, every single other person who comes in here, you know, they kind of look at it, they scoff. And about mm, five minutes later, they come running upstairs asking for my attention and say, you don't actually expect me to do this, right? But you didn't do that. You, you were down here and I was hoping that you were okay. And you are because you're done. And I, I said, oh, wait, I'm really confused here. So if no one else has done this before, then why did you ask me to do this? And he said, it's because I felt like there was something different about you, that there was something that I could look to you. And I was kind of honestly testing you. And after that day, he actually fast tracked what I was able to do. He was normally going to get me to do some boring administrative work uh, the next work day, kind of putting in some numbers into an Excel chart. Instead, he gave me an entire a tour of the studio. He introduced me to the quality assurance managers. He talked to me about the gameplay process. He talked to me about the creation of characters. And this is something that he told me he definitely wouldn't have been able to fit in into a co-op experience had I not proven myself. Now, the moral of this story is 
I could have easily given up on myself. I could have looked at that task as the most mundane task that has nothing to do with what I expected to do. But instead, instead of giving up on myself, instead of giving up in that moment, I said, no, I got to do something about this. I found those solo cups and I got the job done. So I want you to think the next time that there is a mundane task that you're asked to do in your life and in your career, that there's a real opportunity there for you to shine and you never know what's on the other side. So that solidified things for me. And actually I decided I wanted to pursue a career in the video game industry full time. So I graduated from the game art and design program at the Art Institute of Vancouver with a video game design degree. It was incredible. I knew that this is what I wanted, especially after talking to that manager. And I was lucky because this is where I had an opportunity to learn more about myself and shift some policies. Now, contrary to what my uh, friend, Mr. Zoolander here has to say, um, I didn't actually have a problem with getting inside the building. Let me explain what that building was, by the way. I got a job at one of the biggest game studios in the world, Electronic Arts. And I don't know if you know about the campus at Electronic Arts in Burnaby, but it's a very large campus and it's at the top of a massive hill, extremely steep hill. So imagine me, a wheelchair user every single day having to wheel up that hill. Now I'd already plotted that out. So I knew I was gonna be able to do that every day. But as I said, the challenge for me here had nothing to do with the building elect uh, that Electronic Arts was in. It actually had to do with the bus stop. So let me explain this story to you because this is one of the most interesting, challenging ones for me throughout this entire time of my innovative process. I remember getting and, and memorizing exactly what bus stop I had to get off at. I had you know, pre-planned my route. I'd gone through some training exercises with my coworkers. And that very first day, I was so excited to start my first day. This was now the big leads, ladies and gentlemen. This was no longer the safety net of a co-op. This was now my chance to prove myself at a real game company as an actual employee. So you can imagine my nerves and what I felt like on that first day. And as we slowly got closer to the bus stop, I knew I had to get off at. And I remember seeing the tree as a marker that I knew I was going to have to pull the rope to let the driver know I was going to get off. So I pull the rope and I start to unbuckle my wheelchair from the shackles that were holding me down, that were restraining me, uh, keeping me safe while I was in the bus. And one by one, I started to see my fellow coworkers wearing their EA lanyards getting off in front of me. So I knew I was at the right stop. You know, we all formed a line and one by one, each every, and every person started to get off the bus and I proceeded after them. And as the last person who was in front of me got off the bus, I was expecting the driver to just stop lower the ramp of the bus and let me off so I could get off with everyone else. But before I could say anything, the bus driver just closes the door and begins to drive off. Now, thinking this was some sort of a mistake because you could clearly see I was at the front of the bus. I said, driver, driver, stop, wait, wait, wait a minute. I actually work here too. You see, you see my lanyard, can you let me off? But I wasn't expecting what he had to say next. He said, I can't do that. I said, well, what do you mean you can't do that? He says, well, you see that bus stop sign there? I said, yeah. He says, well, you see how it's missing the accessible decal? He used the word handicap. I despise that word. So I'm going to use the word accessible. I said, sure. He says, well, if that symbol is missing, then that means that the city has determined that this bus stop is not safe for me to let you off at. And that means that the next time that that symbol appears is the only time that I'm going to be able to let you off. I was like, oh, okay. Well, as it happened, the next time that symbol appeared was three blocks later. So get this, not only was I going to have to wheel up that hill every single day to get to work, but now I was going to have to wheel three blocks back just to get to the beginning of where the rest of my coworkers were getting off at. But those are the rules. That was the policy. I had accepted that as my reality. And as the days and even weeks went on, I thought there's nothing I can do about this. Until one day, I met a driver by the name of Chris, and that's where everything changed. You see, Chris, we started to get to know each other on an actual meaningful basis. He'd been my driver for quite some time. I learned a little bit about him, about his family, about why he decided to become a driver. He and I just kind of chatted as we were driving every day to work. And finally, uh, about a month into being my driver, Chris finally says to me, hey, Marco, can I ask you a question? I said, sure. He says, I'm so confused, okay? Every single day, I see that you work at EA because you got that EA lanyard on and I'm letting everyone else off at this one stop, 
but then you're always getting off three blocks later at, at this other stop. And I, I just, I got to know why that is. So thinking I was the smartest person in that room at the moment or on the bus at the moment, I kind of puffed my chest out and I said to him, well, you see that bus stop sign there? You see how it's missing the accessible decal? Well, that means that the city has determined that it's not safe for you to drop me off. Well, Chris re Chris's response was the best. He said, well, that's stupid. <laughs> I agreed with him. That is stupid. That's incredibly stupid. But I said to him, what are we going to do about it? We're just two guys. And he said, no, no, there is something that we can do about it. And with that, he went and talked to his manager, who then talked to the city planner, who then talked to the technician. And they determined that even though that bus stop, when it was originally set up, maybe it was on uneven pavement, maybe it was near thorn bushes, maybe there were some blockades. Now, today, there was no reason why they couldn't actually make that stop an accessible bus stop. It just had been there stuck in policy year after year and nobody had said anything about it. And within a matter of weeks, Chris and I, using our voices together, we were able to come together as a team and actually permanently have that bus stop changed so that it presents the accessibility decal. Chris is a guy who didn't know me as somebody just off the street. But he said that this isn't fair and this isn't right and we have to make a change. And I knew that even if I was not working at EA for the rest of my life, that that bus stop was going to permanently be changed for everyone, whether it was for me, uh, the aging population, the you know seniors that are out there, mothers and fathers with strollers, you name it. Well, isn't it lucky that that did happen? Because in 2010, when the recession hit, very much like we're going through today with COVID, I lost my job along with 1,500 other people at the company. And this is where I was completely devastated because I didn't know what I was going to do. This is what I went to school for. It's exactly what I trained for. And as a person with a disability, it's not like I could go and grab a hard hat and just say I was ready to work uh, on a construction site. I couldn't even go and say I wanted to flip burgers at McDonald's because my goodness, it's too dangerous to have somebody in a wheelchair in the back kitchen flipping burgers where there's hot grease where I could hurt myself. I was devastated. This was a moment that I didn't know what I was going to do, but I decided to continue to pursue a career in the game industry. I decided that maybe there's an opportunity for me to find a way that I could fit in at another company. And so I interviewed at another game company. In fact, it went really well. So well, in fact, that I was sure that I was going to get the job. And in a, a couple of days later, when the HR manager called me, I was so excited. Uh, and I was thinking he was going to tell me that I got the job, but I could kind of tell his energy was different on the phone. He was kind of quiet. And he said to me, unfortunately, Marco, we've gone ahead with someone else. I said, okay, that's not a problem. Do you have any tips on how I can improve myself in the future uh, for future job interviews? There was dead silence on the phone. I was like, hello? Yeah, yeah, sorry, I'm still here. Sorry, do you have any tips? Uh, well, I don't really know how to tell this to you, but uh, we felt you have too much energy. You, you felt I have too much energy. Uh, okay. Yeah, and we don't really know how we could mold that energy into what we're looking for in our company. Uh, so we went ahead with someone else. Oh, okay. Thank you very much. I have too much energy. I will work on that. I appreciate that. Thank you. And sure enough, I interviewed with another company a couple of days later, completely different side of town, completely different company, completely different hiring manager. Again, I think it goes well. The manager calls me, tells me, unfortunately, I didn't get the job. And I kid you not, I asked the person what I could do to improve. And his answer was, you have too much energy. Whoa, whoa, whoa. Wait a minute here. Wait a minute here. There's something going on here. I, I have too much energy. I, I don't really know what to do with this. Again, thank you very much. And I remember calling my girlfriend at the time, my now wife, and telling her, honey, this isn't going very well. I've lost my job. I'm trying to find other jobs. And I don't really know what to do. And I was expecting that she was going to be devastated on the other end of the phone. You know, uh, we'd been together for quite a while now. We were living together. Obviously, making, making an income is important. And she starts jumping for joy on the other end of the phone. I was like, wait a minute, why are you so excited that I lost my job and I can't find a job? And she said, because I don't think this is your true calling. I think that you were meant to go out there and light a fire in people and help them find what their passion is in life. And that's something that you've always been doing for you as a person. And I think you have it in you to do that yourself. 
I was like, well, that's really all good and well, but I'm just one guy. I mean, how can I do that for myself? Then I thought back to Chris, the bus driver. And I thought, well, Chris and I were just one guy. And then I started to think about the other people who were just one guy or one lady that I've seen in the world who have made incredible uh, movements in their life and actions towards positive change. Guys like Rick Hansen, who in the mid 80s wheeled around the world in his wheelchair to raise money for spinal cord injury research. And today he's now raised hundreds of millions of dollars for spinal cord injury research and people with disabilities across Canada and North America. And I bet you didn't know this, it's because of guys like Rick that we have so many curb cuts in the city because the very first place that he had his foundation established was at the campus of UBC and they didn't have any curb cuts at the time and he spoke up and he used his voice. And that's why Vancouver is very accessible today. Or guys like Terry Fox, who started out as one guy to raise awareness about cancer research. It was just for himself, it was just for his family, and now today, there are kids and schools everywhere that still run in his namesake. And so I really was able to determine that self-employment was an opportunity for me. I didn't really know what to do, but I decided to just get started. And I was going to use every single innovative tactic and skill that I learned on my way to the game industry and everything I learned about myself along the way to build up my business. And it turned out that for me, losing my job happened to be the best thing ever. Once I started to kind of believe in myself and combine my love and skills with technology, with my appreciation of lived experience as a person with disability and knowing a little bit about accessibility, I was able to make a platform for myself to make positive change. You know, and in fact, you can see right there, there's a photo of a man who's in another wheelchair there with me. Wouldn't you know that that very man I was talking about, Rick Hansen, was a guy that I had as a poster on my wall when I was a kid. And now as a result of becoming a speaker and believing in myself as a consultant, that I actually had the opportunity to work with Rick, who's one of my mentors my entire life. And just by way of doing the right thing, making positive and meaningful connections, I was eventually able to find my way to working directly with the man in motion himself. Now, this is truly incredible in the way of itself, but this is now where we get into the meat and potatoes of what you can do to transform the leadership and culture of not only the organizations that you dream about working with, but also the leadership and culture that you believe in yourself. You see, as it says on the screen here, everyone has the ability to showcase their unique talents and their qualities, right? And you don't have to do it alone. As you see in my stories, I've been able to do this in a team environment my entire life. And in fact, it was such a attractor for people, for me, when I was starting out as a speaker, people kept asking me, Marco, how the heck are you doing what you're doing? How are you accelerating your brand? How are you meeting the people you're meeting? How are you getting involved in the meetings you're meeting, uh, uh, people you're meeting? And I said to them, well, I don't know. I just creatively utilized my best energy. And people asked me, can you teach me how to do that? I said, well, oh, it's not snake oil or anything. It's literally just the way in which I do things. It's the way in which I break down information and tasks that gets things done for me. And I reflect on my energy. <laughs> they said, yeah, but that's really valuable. Can you teach me how to do that? And I said, you know what? I think I could probably teach you how to do that. Yeah, absolutely. So I went on a pathway to formulize how I was doing things in my own life to teach people how to do that with their lives and their careers. Now, Leading up to this moment, we've talked a lot about creativity in situations where you're working with your environment. But what about creativity when it comes to feeling bogged down when you break down tasks? We all do schoolwork, we all do work work, and sometimes it feels like it just is never ending and we can't get it done. There's just not enough time in the day. But I learned early on when I was breaking down things innovatively that it actually comes down to breaking things down into smaller chunks. Now, you remember from the sorting screws story, I literally was sorting things by thread count, size, you name it. And I thought to myself, there's got to be a better way to breaking down the things you want to learn, the things you want to absorb in life. And it turns out there is. I bet you'll never look at a task again once I show you this paragraph. The author of The Slight Edge, Jeff Olson, says, if you've ever wanted to read a book and you say you don't have time to do it, just read 10 pages of a good book a day. And then after only one year, that is 3,650 pages 
of the equivalent of one or two dozen books of life transforming material. Now think about that. It's just 10 pages a day. Now I know we have audio books and things of this nature today, but that's just a way for you to visualize how we can break things down. Now, how does breaking things down uh, tie into the body language that we have, the way in which people kind of parse us out and the way that they look at us. Now, Michael, I'm going to call on you here because you can see the chat window and I can't, but I want people to write in the chat window right now how much of communication they think is based on body language and visual cues in a percentage. So like, you know, whatever, 10%, whatever the case may be. And Michael, maybe just let me know what people are saying. Uh, we've got 80%, 90%, 80, yep. 90, 70%. Okay. All very close, all very close. Do you know that in a, uh, a, a few studies, they've actually determined that it can be as high as 93% based on body language, while only 7% is consistent of the words themselves. Now, how does that reflect in today's world? Well, think about it. We're all working from home. We're doing school from home. And what do we have staring back at us when we're doing this? A camera, a webcam. Now you might think that you're shielded or you're safe by your social media on your phone or your webcam, but as I'm sure you've all determined, people are still watching you when you're watching them. And so this is really important to remember that our body language says more about us than we realize. And so the next time that you're in a meeting or that you're uh, actually, uh, you know, maybe at a school project, remember that when you want to make a pragmatic point, when you want to make a point where you're really confident with yourself, make sure not to be looking around and this kind of thing, but actually bother to stare right at the iris of your web camera as though it's another person looking back at you. Remember that that is exactly like the person's face staring back at you. It's hard to get used to that. It's hard to jump in and, and be prepared for that because we're so used to connecting with people, especially with the masks these days. It's really hard to read body language. But people do make impressions of us within a matter of seconds just based on that body language. So if you're mm, yawning or not prepared for a meeting or you're looking at your watch, people are going to judge you just based on that. And you know, those conversations around body language also tie into what we're wearing. Even today, I kid you not, uh, you know, this is an important webinar for me. So I'm actually dressed up. I'm wearing a dress shirt and no, I am not wearing sweatpants today because your, your school uh, can kind of feel that too. And what you're wearing uh, is reflective of how you feel on the inside. So I know that if I had an important test, an important meeting, a job interview, I actually dress to the nines or I dress up, put my Air Jordans on, you know, I'm still comfortable, but I want it to be reflective of who I am as a person because people can feel that. I'm sure you've probably heard that people can hear you smiling on the other end of the phone when you're talking to them, if you're happy or if you're sad or if you're mad and the same thing goes for what we're wearing. So, you know, it's, it really does play a part in this, but where does energy play a part? Well, in my research, I actually learned that there's four main types of energy that we put out there. There is uh, passive energy, concealed aggressive or passive aggressive, otherwise known as openly aggressive and assertive. So let's break down each one of these uh, four types of energy. And let's just talk about this for two seconds. Very special. Now, Milton, don't be greedy. Let's pass it along and make sure everyone gets a piece. Okay, but last time I didn't receive a piece. And I was told that just I just pass. It, okay. It, but this, this, it, it, there's, there's, I, I can see the, the cake. There's lots of cake. But there's many people. The ratio of people to cake is too many. Many people. Okay. So that's one of my favorite movies, Office Space. And uh, now here's the interesting thing. This is passive energy. And I want to have a disclaimer in that having passive energy isn't necessarily a bad thing. Okay. Having passive energy in the right environment can be a good thing, but I want people to comment in the chat window right now. What did you notice about Milton? What about his passive energy? Did you notice uh, as far as the way in which his other coworkers were interacting with him in this small scene here? And Michael, if you have feedback as well, feel free to chime in. 
Yeah, well, they certainly they were certainly like uh, talking down to him, you know, like he was, uh, you know, like they he was below them, like he was almost like a child, you know. <laughs> That's right. Yeah, and and the the woman there is just saying just pass. You know, yeah. he's trying to voice his concerns and, and saying that he didn't get a piece last time, and she's just kind of disregarding him and saying just pass. Yeah. But isn't it interesting too that that Milton is a guy that's prepared for work. He does have his hair done, but it's kind of disheveled. It's kind of neatly done, but it's kind of messy at the same time, which is really strange. Mm -hmm. He has his shirt tucked in, but it's also kind of wrinkly as well. And I, I would get the impression that this is not the first time that Milton's coworkers have walked all over him and kind of he set precedence to how they treated him. Mm -hmm. Anyone else have any comments uh, from, from the chat? Oh yeah. Lots of, uh, you know, like he's invisible, you know, that's a, that's a, right. a, a big one ignoring him. Like he's a burden. Uh, yeah. It, it, the invisible one is uh, the, the, that one, that one strikes home too, because I think that that's, you know, um, that's a, that's a f real fear that people have, you know, yeah. uh, I, I, I've certainly felt that fear before, you know, like as if like, you don't exist, you know, like people are, are around you and they're acting as if you're not even there. Totally. Totally. And that's the thing is that we've all had moments where we felt a little bit invisible. We've all felt like a Milton and look, everybody has a good day and everybody has bad days. Right. And it's okay for you to live in this, especially for the fact that we're all human beings. So to remember that someone is a human being and it doesn't matter what title you wear when you go to work, that we all have a job to do and we have to do it together. And that's how Milton was treated with his passive energy. So let's move on to the next one, uh, which is um, uh, passive aggressive. So here's another friend of mine, Miss April Ludgate from Parks and Recreation, another amazing show. Now, here's the cool thing about April's uh, statement here. Someone's asked her to do something at work and she said, I'd be happy to. Now, if you just read that on a piece of paper, you would assume, oh, she'd be happy to. But look at her body language for a second. Does it not look like she's giving daggers to the person who's asked her to do something? And this is actually a story that's taken directly from my wife and her work experience. She actually worked with somebody um, who, uh, you know, hierarchically was underneath her in uh, sort of the, the work hierarchy. And my wife is very polite and she's, she's such a very sweet woman. And she'd always ask this, this woman, could you give me a hand with this? And, but this person, I think, uh, you know, maybe took it the wrong way or the energy was misperceived because she would always say, I'd be happy to, I'd be happy to. But her body language said something completely different. And I always thought that that was really, really interesting in the fact that um, it was totally perceived in a completely different way. So, you know, remember that your words might be saying one thing while your body is saying something completely different and just monitor or manage what that could mean for you in these environments where you're interacting with people. Here we go, <laughs> Mr. Michael Scott, for those of you who know The Office. Now, this is what we call the aggressive energy, the openly aggressive energy. This is the person that in any school project, work project, these kinds of things, they always feel like they have the right answer or the, the, the best sort of response. And they're the first person to put up their hand and say, well, I know the answer to that. It's obvious, you know, and they're definitely uh, what you'd consider a bull in a china shop. They're going to kind of bull someone over and feel as though they have all the right answers. Now, reflecting on myself, this is probably the energy that I was giving off in, uh, in these meetings when I was uh, job interviewing. Full disclosure, as you can probably tell, I'm a very high energy guy, as we've heard throughout the presentation, but sometimes that energy could be misconstrued. Uh, maybe it was so intense that someone thought, mm, I don't know if I can manage this, as they, they kind of let me know. And I think that they misunderstood the fact that I was a very, I'm a very sort of assertive person. I'm a very kind of uh, up there person. But I guess when I get nervous, just like any one of us, we can be guilty of this, that it can be misunderstood or, or mis, you know, misconstrued. And I think that that's something to be aware of. So where we want to land is what I said, assertive energy. That's where you're self-confident, you're even tempered. When you're looking into your web camera, that you're looking directly into the iris when you wanna make a point. It's okay if your monitor is at a different location, if you want to gauge how the person's reacting to you, but make sure like you would if you were reading a speech at a podium, that you look back at that camera and you're making sure that you're making direct eye contact with the people. And Michael, just to be clear, can people see my face right now or is it just the presentation? Oh no, we can see you. 
okay, perfect. Because this entire time I've been making very uh, <laughs> sure that I'm staring at the camera and I don't even know if people can see me. Um, and now uh, you, you want to make sure you're expressing your views and that you're leaving room for other people to make suggestions as though you're not always the one with the right answer. Give space for people to express their feelings and how they feel about the situation. Be less concerned with winning and actually be open to negotiating. And of course, the golden rules, treat others the same way that you would like to be treated. So, you know, give them the same respect. Now that seems like a no brainer, but you know, that's, it's kind of an interesting thing. And actually to this, I actually have this really cool thing called a hat exercise. Now this is not uh, my exercise. This is another consultant that I've worked with in the past um, who's done this before. I thought it was so ingenious. I wanted to share this with you. So there is a digital handout following today's presentation that everyone on the mailing list who signed up for today's talk is gonna get a screen cap of this, a PDF of this. Um, and I want you to think about this the next time you're utilizing your friends or your team members when you're in a group activity or project. Think about the hat you're wearing. So I'm not going to read out all of these answers, but uh, basically there's several hats. If the white hat, you're objective, red, you're intuitive, black, you're negative, uh, yellow, you're positive, and green, you're creative. Now, if you're normally one type of person, an overly positive person or an overly objective person, try to uh, take a spin in someone else's shoes, step into their shoes and, and try to take the other perspective. Be aware of your potential biases that we talked about earlier. Make sure you hold other people accountable in terms of making sure you're giving the space for everyone else to be heard. And when you're making big, de big, big decisions, make sure everyone has a voice at the table. So take away from this presentation today how you can kind of step into someone else's shoes and can gain their pr uh, perspective. Uh, lead with empathy, not sympathy. Be empathetic towards someone's situation. Don't look down upon them, okay? And how does this tie into the way in which we network? Well, you know, with the Q principle, I always say, it's so important to remember that you are only one or two people away from that really important connection that you've been looking for. That could be a cousin, an uncle. Uh, for me in the game industry, it was letting people know that I was interested in becoming a game designer. And then later when I transitioned to being a speaker, it was, who did I know? Did I work with not-for-profits that could have interest in having me speaking at least at the beginning for free to get my name out there, to get the word out, that kind of thing. And once you know it, I found that the more meaningful of a connection that I was making with people, the more that I was actually able to stretch out and actually find new opportunities. That's how I ended up meeting Rick Hansen. That's how I ended up getting into some of the jobs I got into and ultimately becoming an entrepreneur. So think about your web, think about your connections, every single connection that you're making on social media. Think about how you can actually care about the people you're connecting with, okay? Now, why is this important? Well, we've kind of talked about this at length, but you share different strengths and perspectives by bringing that to the table. You discover new abilities about yourself and talents you didn't know existed. And you encourage an open dialogue. I'm being very vulnerable with you today, sharing these very personal stories, and that's okay. I'm totally fine with it because I'm hoping that someone in the audience is gonna light a spark and see something in themselves that they didn't see before. So open that dialogue and be willing to let people explain to you who they are and why they're there. How do you make authentic connections? Well, get to know your team members. Actually bother to get to know them. Don't just look at them as a commodity. Discover their why. Support them to reach their goals. And remember, I said here every conversation, but that might be a little bit of overkill. Remember every important conversation because it can lead to new opportunities and connections. I break down these connections into three main groups, collectors, connectors, and jerks. Let me quickly explain to you what that is. So the collectors are the people that they'll want to add you on social media, um, and they just kind of want to beef up their, uh, their following list, right? They have no actual intent of caring about who you are or what you do. They just want to look more important. Or if you're in person with them, there are people that just want to get your business card or information about you so they can, you know, uh, say that they know you because you're so cool and important. You definitely don't want to be there. Then there, there are the jerks who will connect with you on LinkedIn, social media, and not only do they just want to connect you and add you like Pokemon, like the collectors, but now they actually want to connect with you and then immediately sell you on a product or service. Don't be that guy, okay? Or, or lady. <laughs> what you want to be is the true connector. This is somebody that actually bothers to get to know the person when they're connecting with them. Oh, that's great that you're uh, you know, in this particular industry. What made you want to do that? Oh, interesting, interesting. And as I started out in my career and building my business, at every single meeting or, or networking 
uh, event, I would actually take the person's business card and write a few bullet points on the back of their card to kind of teach myself or remind myself as to who they were. Oh yeah, they have an interest in going to Africa. Oh, they're a marathon runner, this kind of thing. And I would remember that. Now you don't have to do what I do, but I'm very sort of list orientated and I use technology to my benefit. So I actually created an Excel document, which acts like a customer relations management system. So essentially any important conversation where I feel like, hey, I can give without expectation. I can give to this person in the future and maybe they'll give back to me without me actually having an ask. And uh, so I would actually write down some qualities about that person and say, yeah, I'm going to remember this person. And I ended up developing a list of hundreds of people that I met with. Well, wouldn't you know that that actually ended up benefiting me in the future? Very, very quick story, because I know we're getting close to the time here. Uh, I was at a networking event in technology and there was a young guy uh, by the name of Danny. And he really was interested in um, starting in video production. And uh, he told me about this. And I said to him, what's your dream? And he said to me, I want to do video production for the rock bands of the world. You know, I want to, I want to, I want to rock, man. And I was like, oh yeah, that's cool. I'm going to remember that. That's awesome. That's great, Danny. I said, do you have a card? I know you're a student, but you know, you're getting out there. You're, you're wanting to start internships. He, he gave me his card. And I had remembered actually that a few months earlier, I was actually on a daytime talk show. And when I was on the talk show, I was in the green room. And one of the other guests was a producer for music videos locally here in Vancouver. And what did he happen to do? He produced music videos for some of the top rock bands at the time. And I thought to myself, man, I can't quite remember that guy's name, but we had such a good conversation. Actually, you know what? I think it was Stefan. And so I went into my Excel document and I typed in Stefan music producer and boop, sure enough, it pulled up all his information for me. It pulled up the points I'd written down about him. And I said, you know what? I had such a meaningful conversation with Stefan that I actually feel that we could connect again and, and that he might be okay to meet Danny. Well, sure enough, I did an email introduction between Danny and with Stefan. And I, I, I said, maybe you two could get to know each other a little bit better. And as it turned out, Stefan had an opportunity where he was looking for a new student to come and start an internship working with those rock bands. Bingo, bango, I just made an authentic connection between two people with zero expectation for myself. Well, months later, Danny repaid it for me by offering to make me a production video for my business as a speaker at little to no cost. He, he reduced his cost greatly as a thank you. So think about how you can make authentic com uh, conversations and connections in your life to do the exact same thing. And remember to lead with authenticity and give without expectation. And just wrapping it up here, what can you do as team leaders? Set the tone from the top. So don't just do this because, uh, oh, someone else told you to do it. If you're the, the project lead on something, if you wanna be treated with respect, treat everyone else with respect and it will trickle downward. Allow yourself to be vulnerable, as I said earlier. Provide accommodations to your teammates. And remember, I said they might actually be looking uncomfortable. Take them aside and say, hey, I noticed that you're a little uncomfortable. Is there anything that we can do to help you? When possible, be flexible about where and how and the hours at which you're working with these people. And now if your team members, be a peer mentor. You know what it's like to have your first day or your first time starting out on a new task or a new project? Help them out, show them the ropes, be open and welcoming. Don't place your assumptions on other people, as we said at the very beginning of the presentation. But the best thing you can do is ask the person how you can support them. They're going to know more than you because they're an expert on being themselves. And so if you ask them, they're going to tell you the number one way that you can support them. So to wrap it all up, living in a cube mentality means creative problem solving, as you never know what you're going to discover about yourself or other people. Utilizing the people around you. Know that you're not an expert at everything, but the people around you might be experts at something else. And you can build a real badass team. <laughs> be the best version of yourself. Remain authentic and be the same person that you meet in person as you do online. Stop with the facades. Stop with the faking. Stop with the filters. Just be you and trust that that's enough because that's when you're going to attract people that are like you too. And energy starts with you. So remember to be assertive and use your body language and having high energy isn't necessarily a bad thing. All right, thank you so much. I know we had a bit more chatter in the presentation, but I'm, that pretty much concludes it. I'm gonna stop my screen share. And, uh, and Michael and everyone else, uh, I think we might still have a few minutes for overhang. I'm totally okay as long as everyone else is okay with a little bit of extra time. 
Um, and yeah, thank you so much. Well, thank you so much, Marco. You know, I think that, you know, uh, if anyone is looking, you know, for energy sometimes, you know, uh, especially in the in winter, you know, when we have uh, short days, you know, I think what we need is we just need to like tap in uh, to some Marco Pasqua, maybe uh, watch some of your videos, or just listen to you talk, man. I mean, I just had a full day of work and I'm already energized to like get going here. You know, listening to you talk uh, is so inspirational. Your, um, your passion, you know, really comes through. And, you know, some of the key messages I take away is the authenticity um, that you bring and the vulnerability, which doesn't come easily. You know, it's, it's scary to be vulnerable. That's why it's so effective. I think, you know, I think that you, you found that up. That was the lesson that you had very early on um, in the stories that you told was that just how valuable that vulnerability is because it's coming directly from inside you. That is the, the real you. And, that's how you make a real connection. That's how you gain trust. Um, and uh, I, I'm, I'm super inspired just listening to you, man. Oh, thanks a lot, Michael. And, and in all sincerity, I truly do hope that people will go away from this and they're going to tell their friends about it. They're going to start talking about the cube principle and how you can implement that in your own life. You know, I, I only did it as an acronym because it's the easiest way for people to remember creatively utilize your best energy. I want yeah. everyone and that's going to be different for everyone. But you see how I took something that someone said to me was a fault in having that energy and figured a way to channel that energy in order to make it the best part of who I am and, and who I wanted to be as a person. I know that there are people that are quieter than myself. And like I said, that's okay. We all wear different hats, but the biggest takeaway is remember that together, accumulatively, we do the greatest things as a society when we're open to the ideas that other, bring, other people bring to the table. And so I really truly hope you'll take that uh, digital takeaway sheet once it's handed out and you'll share with people some of the the messages that you learned here today. Yeah, absolutely. Um, one really great question that came in uh, from Nico. We'll, uh, we'll sort of wrap things up. It's probably a big question, uh, but uh, I think it's a really important one to tackle. So um, Nico asks, uh, through your journey of disability, uh, changing career paths, have you ever struggled with mental health? If so, how were you able to turn these instances around and motivate you towards your goals? Yes, actually, I'll tell you. Um, so one of the things I do now is as an accessibility consultant, and I actually had an opportunity to work with 25 of the top business leaders, as uh, Michael said in my intro. And uh, one of the companies that I worked with was Van City Credit Union. If you're in Vancouver, then you'll be very familiar with Van City. And when I was working with them as a consultant, in order for me to understand their culture, they actually had me housed at their head office in downtown Vancouver near Science World uh, to, to learn about how they do things as a company and as a society. And they told me that um, the mental health was very important to them. Well, mental health was so important to them, actually, that I learned that they had programs around mental health. And it was the first time ever in working with Van City only two years ago as a consultant that I opened up to people that I've struggled with anxiety and depression for at least 20 years. And I felt like a little bit like I was a, uh, had imposter syndrome or as a fraud at the beginning. That's why I was afraid to talk about it because I didn't want people to think, wait a minute, a motivational speaker is having anxiety and depression. How does that work? How does that make sense? But as I learned, those vulnerabilities actually become your strengths. And if you feel comfortable enough to talk to people about what you're going through, they'll actually respect you more when you're sharing the fact that you actually have some of these things going on for you because then it reminds them that you're not impenetrable, that you're a human being just like everyone else and that you're going through real human problems just like everyone else. And like I said, this was only two years ago that I started opening up about it, but the more that I've been willing to share that kind of content, the more that people have actually positively embraced me and the fear that I had was only the fear that I placed on myself. So by opening up about that, by doing meditation, by taking deep breaths, I've been working with my wife. My wife loves doing yoga. We do yoga together. We do uh, nightly stretches, things of this nature to kind of really break any kind of remuneration of negativity or negative thoughts. And that's made a real difference, especially during COVID when you're spending a lot of time inside. So I would encourage you that if you're having similar thoughts, know that it's not the end of the world. Know that with the right connections, with the right people in your life, there are, there's always somebody that loves you, cares about you, and is going to be here for you. And the second that you feel comfortable, if you feel comfortable, 
come forward with that because you don't know if someone's just been waiting for you to break the silence so that they can talk to you about it too. Absolutely. Great advice, Marco. You know, I think that that's something, you know, that this pandemic has uh, done for all of us is that it's sort of, it's gained this collective empathy um, because we're all sharing an experience in different ways, but we are all going through something. So we know you know, how good it makes us feel when somebody reaches out to us and says, hey, how are you doing today? You know, and and then when you say, yeah, sure, uh, I'm doing OK. The follow up is like, no, really, uh, how are you doing? You know, um, that that shows that makes you feel good that somebody cares about you. And we're all going through this. And um, this is something that as we uh, go through our all journeys, all our uh, various paths we're going to be on, we're going to come across, you know, um, challenges like this. This is not going to be the last collective challenge that we're going to have as a human species. And we're certainly not going to be the last personal challenge that we're going to have. So these lessons uh, are going to stay with us forever. And, um, you know, I think we got to wrap it up there, Marco, but thank you yep. so much um, for this. Um, for everyone that stuck with us uh, on this webinar, thank you so much. Uh, some important dates that you should know on February 15th is when the Youth Innovation Showcase opens up. So if if you've been inspired hearing uh, Marco's words, go to youthinnovation.ca and um, check out uh, the showcase that we got this year. Um, it's going to be a fun one. You know, we uh, uh, transitioned to online this year, so um, it's going to be a challenge, but it is now is a little bit more uh, accessible to people um, uh, across the province. So um, the other thing that we uh, started up this year is that we've got a podcast where I originally talked to Marco. Um, um, our next episode is with Cameron Beck from Kids Code Genus, uh, who will be running a workshop, the next workshop next month as part of the Youth Innovation Showcase. That is going to be February 24th. Uh, again, it's going to be virtual, but if you live in the Yukon, there is actually going to be in-person opportunities uh, up there in the Yukon, uh, which is just fantastic. I can't wait to uh, get back to in-person uh, opportunities. That sounds it's close. You know, I can feel it in my bones, in-person opportunities. <laughs> we're, we're not there yet, but we're close and I can feel it yeah. in my bones. Super excited. That workshop is going to be called Learn the Basics Block Coding with Scratch. Uh, so if you're into oh, cool. coding, definitely want to check out um, uh, Cameron Beck from Kids Code Genus. Uh, and you'll explore the possibility of codes through games, animations, interactive storytelling. Uh, Scratch encourages students to solve problems, tell exciting stories, design projects, communicate ideas using highly visual block-based code. And this is what we talked about in the podcast. So uh, check that out. That episode is going to be coming out uh, in a couple weeks, I think. Um, and... We'd also love to have all you register for something called Sweatin' for Science. Uh, <laughs> if you go to sweatinforscience.ca, uh, um, you're going to learn all about this. It's going to raise money for science fairs in your community. Um, so if you love sweating, you know, like uh, like the man in motion, uh, Rick Hansen did, <laughs> <laughs> you know, uh, I certainly do. I, I love I love getting out there. I love sweating for science. Uh, definitely check that out. Um, would love to have your support. Uh, Marco, any final words? words and where can people find out more about you and what you do yeah very simple they can just go to marcopasqua.com and they can learn more about what it is that i do um but yeah no i, I just want to say thank you to everyone you know it's uh no matter how many presentations i give uh, i was saying to the group before we went live um you always feel a little bit of nerves and that's not a bad thing it's always good to feel nerves and feel butterflies because that means that you care about what it is that you're doing so remember that if you guys are innovative, if you want to use your innovation in your career, you know, pursue a career in the game industry or technology or whatever the case may be, science. I love everything that I learned through technology, through science, and I wouldn't trade it for the world um, because I was able to learn about myself and transfer those skill sets for myself and my, my business. So I just thank you so much from the bottom of my heart, everyone, from being active listeners. And I hope that you go out there and you, you make some meaningful connections. So be, be a real connector. Don't be one of those, uh, you know, those jerks we talked about. <laughs> That's right. Be, get out there, be open, be vulnerable. Uh, thank you so much, everyone. We will see you again next time.